Okay, I'm ready. Thank you for coming. Today I'm going to continue a little bit with the presentation and the analysis, the discussion of themes, the analysis of passages from the lightning conductor, because that will be the last class we devote to that particular novel. And then from that I'll go right into the scenes from the second half of the film, Christine, and we'll see how much of, of that we'll be able to watch. I will circulate the pages for the notes on the film. It's up to you to do it on the Google Docs file on those pages. If you do it on the Google Docs file, do it now or by tomorrow, don't wait until next week. Also, keep in mind that this is the second time that you write notes on Christine, and Christine is certainly not a film by Fellini or Tarkovsky. So you've written already, a lot of you have written extensive notes, so this time especially, don't include descriptive notes. Write less. Focus on the commentary. Comment on details specific twists in or, or lines or moments in the film provide short commentary of significant aspects that you identify in the story, in the development of the characters, or in the visual style. Okay, so don't feel the need to provide two pages to get a better grade, okay? You have my permission to write less because you've written already about this film and see if you get any great ideas about the film while you're watching it, but about specific things you see. And otherwise, if you feel that you don't have a lot to, to say, it's fine this time. We, we have an understanding, we have an agreement in regards to that. Once again, I want to remind you that if you live locally or uh, if you're on campus this weekend, uh, on Sunday, October 8, from 10 a.m. until 1 p.m., uh, we organize the 17th Concorso d'Eleganza, presented by the Center for Italian Studies. I'll be there, I'll be there very early setting up uh, the event uh, with a few volunteers. Come by, and if you do, of course, uh, come say hi, if you see me around. More importantly, if you come, try to talk to uh, one or two of the car owners. If you approach them, they're, they're always available, always willing to talk, but if you approach them with a specific interest, showing your interest in this and your uh, expertise, your knowledge uh, of, of this area, automobile and society, you, you get into more interesting dialogues. And if you then write a short report, you can have, have extra credit for participation at this event, okay? Tonight, uh, tomorrow night, the end of Friday, would be the deadline for the next written assignment, the one about fear and fascination of technologies uh, related to mobility, with reference to <coughs> The Master of the World by Jules Verne, uh, the novel we analyzed previously. The key to doing a good job for that assignment is really selecting just a few strong, relevant passages, okay? But keep in mind that we want to focus on how the reaction to the technology is codified into the characters of that novel, okay? So keep this in mind because there are passages in the book that we read that are intended for the reader, that are supposed to leave an impression on the reader. But then, of course, there is the main character, the good guy, 
shrug, who's there to arrest or, or block uh, the madman inventor, prevent him from provoking chaos in the world. And that character himself is then fascinated by this technology, although he remains aware of the potential for disruption caused by the technology. So focus on this character's reaction, the reactions of John Strzok and how they're presented. And as I said, you don't need more than two or three good examples with an analysis to follow. It doesn't have to be a mini paper, okay? It's fine as long as you don't have 10 short passages and then bullet point commentary. That's not what I want. Fewer passages with some commentaries. It's good if you can keep some continuity, but as I said, it doesn't have to be a short paper, okay? A miniature paper with the introduction, with the conclusion, uh, with the sources, etc. Our source is the text itself. We're trying to do analysis, showing me your understanding of the text and how you can read the themes of technology in the text and understand them okay that's the level of the assignment that's it for my introduction i'll sit down because this way i can scroll up and down and therefore i will not be able to see this side of the room if you have questions you want to interrupt me just shout Okay, and I'll stop and, and turn and take your questions. And I'll circulate these later as well as the attendance. At the end, before you leave, take the notes uh, that you wrote in the past. There are some still uh, from the films. Some are about the bird activity. They're organized, sorted by last name. So, Make sure that you take everything because you might have more than one here, but it will be the next page because it's sorted. If you did it online, I review uh, notes and uh, the in-class activity for almost everyone. Uh, only four or five are left, which I'll try to do as soon as possible. Okay, so this is the third collection of passages from the novel, right? And then you have the official excerpts. But in here, I, I took down some passages and I used the outline format to isolate sentences related to a certain theme. And then I added a few words about the ideas, but I want to comment some with you uh, to show what is hidden inside of even such a low-level product, right? This is not high literature. This is almost the equivalent of the romance genre novels of today, the various Arlequin, etc. Yet, you can read the ideology, the view of society, the view of the world, and the view of the coming revolution caused by technologies such as the automobile, even in a plain love story such as this one. For example, in this particular passage, what strikes me as interesting is this idea that I mentioned on Tuesday as well, that the people from the time derived from their limited understanding of Charles Darwin's theories. The idea that based on your natural qualities and what you're able to make with them, but more importantly, based on the interaction between your natural skills, your natural talents, and the context, right? Because you might be a great warrior, but if you live during a period of peace, then your skills are not in demand. You might be great at physical fights, but if the war of today doesn't include physical one-to-one -one combat, then your skills are not in demand. Based on what skills nature endowed you with, 
what you did with those skills, whether or not you develop them fully. And based on the fact that those skills could be in demand in your social ecosystem or not, then you eventually find what is supposed to be your natural place in society, right? There is a conservative ideology behind this that predicates that the hierarchy in society, in terms of both wealth and power, is not disconnected from nature. That for most people, the place in that hierarchy is determined by their natural skills, how they develop them, and whether or not those skills are in demand and, and therefore considered essential, strategic, useful. The way this ideology translates for the character of the driver who pretends to be just a driver from the lowest place in society and in fact we know is a British aristocrat who goes by the name of John Winston or Jack. The passage presents the woman's point of view, Molly's point of view of this driver. As far as she knows, he is just a driver, right? So someone, she's the daughter of an American millionaire, American aristocracy, and he's down there with the populace. So they're not supposed to get married, they're not supposed to connect at a deeper level, just a servant, basically. However, she finds him worthy of a higher standing. She recognizes in him the right qualities to occupy a different place in society. And this is one of several passages where she finds justification for her feelings, the growing feelings for him. Meaning, she knows that they belong to different places in society. At the same time, she can see that he should be at a higher level in society, much closer to her. Yes, he doesn't have a big salary, doesn't have a formal education, she, she. That's her supposition. But in fact, she has all the skills, all the qualities to be in a position of leadership and therefore worthy of her attention from her social point of view. Let's review some of these passages and again if you have questions beyond what I'll be offering as a commentary just ask me to explain more. So Brown is the assumed name of Winston, the British aristocrat, pretending just to be a driver which is a narrative trope we find in other novels. I quoted one from a few years later, a six-cylinder courtship. Brown is a very good-looking fellow, too good-looking for a mere chauffeur. But again, it's not about beauty. It's about the exterior appearance and therefore the natural qualities, the biology, that shows where you belong in society, okay? So it's not like I can, feel, I can fall in love with, with this guy because he's handsome. No, I can fall in love with this guy even though I'm a part of the American aristocracy, I'm upper level, the upper echelon in society, because I can see that he doesn't belong there. He belongs to a higher and the description I'll, I'll, I'll skip, notice how she insists on this. One can help noticing these things even in one's chauffeur. So I know it's a chauffeur, but in terms of the natural place in society, he belongs to a higher place. Some things really are a pity, but never mind. Because it was also part of the discussion, especially in England, more so in England than in the US, 
Uh, if you read, for example, H.G. Wells, are you familiar with uh, time travel? He's the inventor of uh, the novels on the time travel machine, etc., and other science fiction novels. He also wrote a lengthy novel called Machiavelli, the new Machiavelli, around this time, where he talks a lot about the wrongs that derive from a classist society. Basically, H.G. Wells was saying, we are wasting talent and we are wasting in British society opportunities for growth, for progress, unless we give opportunities for talent to come out. Meaning, even if a young person comes from the lower classes, they should be afforded a higher level education, university, high school, university, because if they have natural skills, then the entire society will benefit from taking them out of their social context. Okay? But again, even this looks like almost a pseudo-socialist view of society, but it isn't. Okay? But we won't get into that. So when she says some things really are a pity, she means, I can see that he should be a member of the upper class that he should be somewhere else in society. So this is the time in the novel where there is a confrontation between Molly, the French guy who sabotaged her first car, and then, of course, James, the, the British lord who pretends to be a driver. So, Molly realizes what is going on with her car. She confronts the Frenchman who eventually admits to sabotaging her, the car so that she could continue. He could then offer a, a ride on his own car, send Jack away, get rid of the driver because he can see he, that the driver is, is too beautiful, so handsome, and, and therefore a potential rival. Right? So all of this is well organized. And the confrontation between the two men emphasizes the same thought, social theme. Because the Frenchman is rich, rich enough to have a car, right? And the kind of car he has would be a car as, as ex expensive as a small house, right? So he should be marriage material for Molly. He should be somebody he must consider as a potential husband. In fact, it is clear that the rich man doesn't have the natural skills, the natural leadership, to deserve to be at that place, at that higher place in society. And vice versa, the alleged driver has much more leadership and therefore the choice is made by her justifiably. Right? So, uh, there is this confrontation. I'm not going to read everything. We could stop just to consider this passage here where she says he, James Brown, the driver, really ought to have been a gentleman. Meaning, he has all the qualities. It's such a waste of good material, meaning nature gave him this leadership, but society placed him at the bottom of the scale. The Lord, which is a replacement for nature, using him up for a chauffeur when any common staff would have done for that, right? Meaning he deserves to be much more than a chauffeur. Behind that, there is an entire ideology, and the root of that is the publication of the origin of the species and the rough, rudimentary application of that text to society, to the views of society. Okay. Uh, let's skip to the confrontation between Molly. Now, it's important, very important to understand that before Brown, the aristocrat pretending to be a driver, intervenes, it's Molly herself who confronts the Frenchman, meaning she's not acting like a damsel in distress. Oh, save me, save me, this, this awful Frenchman destroyed my car. Come do something. No. She is behaving like 
a strong independent woman as it was conceived by proto-feminism under the label of the new woman movement. However, this is still a conventional, a rather conventional love story, and therefore she will first show her strength confronting the Frenchman, and then she will switch roles from taking the initiative to getting outside of this and letting his prospective companion, Brown, intervene. Okay, but as we'll see later, it is also a matter of respecting his leadership as much as he, James Brown, respects her uh, power and independence. Okay, so Molly says to the Frenchman, I don't want you to pay, to pay for the damages to the car, right? I only want you to go away, leave me alone, right? Don't bother me. And she says, I emphasize these words with a gesture, I read in the highlight, and the Frenchman grabs her arm. I also have a dim impression of exclaiming, oh brown, meaning, oh God, <laughs> but in this case is oh brown meaning what is going on, in a frightened voice, just as silly as had been an early Victorian female. So notice how she emphasized that she's taking this traditional role, but she's not that kind of woman. Okay, so she's playing that role right now. Early Victorian meaning the submissive wife, the submissive woman. I wish I hadn't, but it was too late. Now, she realizes that once she starts playing that part, he, James Brown, Jack, will have to play the part of the strong man who comes to the rescue. She knows it's a game, and that makes a lot of difference, right? It's not like something they do, because it has to be done. It's like performance, because modernity is making those roles, strong man, submissive woman, outdated, okay? So read the nuances in the text, please. Brown evoked, this is a nice passage, Brown evoked was not so easily revoked. So once she <laughs> plays the part of the woman who needs help, of course she'll play that role. Uh, frankly, you, you do find this kind of dynamic even in modern rom-coms. A whirlwind seemed to catch Monsieur Talleyrand up. He comes over, grabs the Frenchman who has dared grab her arm, and, and does what she, he's supposed to, to do. At the end, they've taken care of the Frenchman and they're alone. And this is one of those moments. Yes, there are people because they're outside this inn in France, but they're virtually alone, right? The Frenchman is dismissed and it's just the driver and the woman, and then she realizes that this is not completely appropriate because she came down from her bedroom in some kind of nightgown and robe on top. So she's not properly dressed to be seen by a man who is not her husband. So even in here, she plays the part of the shy early Victorian woman, but it's a part she's playing. Okay, so he says to her, you must be hungry, meaning we could have breakfast together, right? Understand the implication. Shall I ask them to have breakfast prepared by the time you are, pause, ready, meaning dressed up. I believe he was going to say dressed, so by implication, he is calling her attention on the fact that she's not fully dressed. And keep in mind, keep in mind how many layers of clothing this woman from this period had, right? You've seen it in films, but you can see it plenty on the website, meaning the real artifacts showing you really how they dressed. And she goes upstairs, right, back to her bedroom to get ready, Dressed, and she says, when I was upstairs with Aunt Mary, my face feeling rather hot, 
I didn't begin to make my toilet. So she's hot because she has realized that she's gone past the boundaries. And as I said, this is a traditional novel. Nothing radical is ever happening, but she is exploring the boundaries of what is appropriate, something I call edging, meaning pushing the edges uh, of what is appropriate, and then withdrawing without breaking those norms. I didn't begin to make my toilet, I went and peeked out of the window, so she, she had some interest for, for him, and she's not waiting for anyone's permission for that. Let me continue just briefly. Okay, so notice how Jack is defined in here as a male Cinderella, and the references are plain, right? Because supposedly he's from the lower class. And this is one of the many descriptions of speed and the effects of speed. Notice how the speed is defined tremendous, but later on in another passage, there is a, a, a precise number to the speed they have going up the hill. Going up the hill was difficult for some of these cars, if especially the, the ascent was steep. But the numbers she mentions are 12 to 14 miles per hour. That's the speed she finds tremendous. However, Keep in mind, it's an open-top car, vibrating a lot, lots of noises, lots of air coming at you, the sense that you're not completely safe. And I've spoken to people, I spoke to uh, Howard Kroplik, who has a car from 19, 1904, 1908, about that period called the Black Beast, which won the Vanderbilt Cup. And he once went to Indianapolis, and before the, the 500, he and Emerson Fittipaldi, the Formula One champion from the uh, 1970s, went around the track at about 50 miles per hour. And, and Howard, who normally doesn't drive that fast on that car, said, I, I felt I was about to die, but I was perfectly happy to be dying with Emerson Fittipaldi on the Indianapolis track. Okay? The, the, the feeling of speed is multiplied by the circumstance. And in, in some ways that happens also when you're on a bike, especially do, going downhill. Even though you're, you're going down at 30 miles per hour or 40 miles per hour on a bike, on a bicycle, it feels like you're going as fast as a bullet. And notice that she admires how competent he is with the car, but this is only, again, Notice the feminist elements in here. This is only one side of the story because the other side is that she will then be learning how to drive. She will then become proficient at driving and he will admire her, okay? So this is on the way to parity. It's not the traditional submissive woman admiring the strong man. It's a different dynamic if you read this correctly. In fact, later on, 20 pages later, she says, we change places. And this is important because this is a metaphor of their relationship, of a modern relationship, of a modern marriage, okay? Without just the authority of the husband and the obedient wife to follow everything he says. This is Jack writing a letter to a friend and explaining what happened, right? It's his point of view, her point of view, like you find in many novels. She, Molly, put the car at its highest speed and we flew along the infinite perspective of, a, of the never-ending avenue. And notice the isolation. It's not just proximity that is granted by being in the car, but also that no one seems to be around. So... This changing, changes the relationship between two who are not man and wife. This vast pine forest is a desert, and we passed only through small and scattered villages, meaning it's just me, her, and Aunt Mary in the back. That flight through the pine forest, 
should have been pines, not pins, of course, of the land is, will always be to me an, an ineffaceable memory. None of us spoke, two of us felt feeling. I think that we were close to nature's heart. And basically the rest of the description is then them <coughs> feeling more alive and more in tune with nature exactly because they're in the car. Keep this in mind, they're traveling. They're not hiking through a forest and smelling the pines. No, it's the very fact that they're in this machine that makes them a bit anxious, a bit worried, right? Like people from the past who would be flying a plane their first time, their second time, and some people are still anxious about flying this day, then you're more open to every experience. You feel more alive. So it's not <coughs> praising nature. It's praising the technology indirectly that affords you to feel nature in such a way. And then there, there is the proximity. As often as I dared, I stole a look sideways at Miss Randall's profile. She sat erect, her little gauntleted hands resting light as thistle down, down upon the wheel. I'm butchering this, but, uh, but her fingers and her wrist nervous and alert as a jockey riding a thoroughbred, her eyes intent on the long straight road before her and a look almost of rapture upon her face. This idea of the rapture caused by the technology. But this is him admiring her and feeling her that, is she, that she is superior to other women because she has mastered the technology. And so there is a sense of this uh, equality between the genders. Okay. As I, I already remarked about this passage, how after one of the accidents they have, she grabs his hand, right, so that they go past that barrier, and then they have dinner, just the two of them, no supervision, and he dresses up, pretending that those clothes, that suit was loaned to him by his master. And once again, she said, poor fellow, because he looks like a gentleman, he behaves like a gentleman. Nature, however, has placed him lower, but he should be able to climb the social ladder okay this is the passage i was referring to our agreeable napier napier was a british brand famous for their race car race cars uh, simply flew up up the hill at 12 or 14 miles an hour uh, flew up because a car from that time would have either struggled going up not being able to climb certain hills or would have done so at a much lower speed. So this speed going up a hill is considered to be great speed and, and they have more references. The other aspect that is interesting about this novel is this idea of the intoxication, of the addiction to speed, of the fact that it's not the embracing of the technology because we understand that the future belongs to technology. No, it's the rapture. It's the idea that I am feeling things that I cannot control, so it's like a bug. It's like an addiction, an intoxication. It is not rational, it's pre-rational. Careful, Don't move the chair with a computer. Uh, okay, so the language is the same language we find through the same period of time, 1900, 1910, 12, bag, toxic, intoxication, uh, is, or, or drunkenness, all kinds of metaphors from, of a medical, biological nature to suggest that the experience of this technology goes beyond your ability to control it rationally. And that should be enough. more things to say, but we'll, we'll move to uh, Christine. So this is when, circulate the pages, 
This is after Christine has tried to kill Lee and his girlfriend by mysteriously making or magically making her choke in the car while he's outside and he cannot open the doors to rescue her. And after that incident at the drive-in, now Arnie is taking Lee back to her house, but clearly something has broken between them. Right? Lee is not the same. Now Lee feels that her suspicions are correct, that the car has something against her. And we'll watch the rest of this. I'll then skip some scenes and, and go on to the conclusion, which following the same narrative pattern that we found in Jules Verne, entails the destruction of the evil technology. Even though this technology is not completely dead, because we'll see at the end how Christine, reduced to a cube of metal, is then moving her metal limb and trying to uh, get back to her shape. Of course, only to be purchased, found by another unsuspecting customer who will become his her <coughs> evil minion, the way that Arnie. Because Arnie grows up in power and personality, becomes the cool guy, but by the end, he's just a loyal minion to the evil car, right? They're indistinguishable between one and the other. 